This video is the companion commentary to the exercise Underactuated Two Link Simulation. It assumes you've already passed the hurdles of getting WeBots and Python 3 installed, and it's more notes on the exercise, uh, enough to get you going on the exercise. This will be pretty rough. I'm going to kind of riff on a lot of points uh, just to kind of add commentary and help understand what's going on. So here's WeBots with the sample code loaded. Uh, a few comments just on what happens when you load something. Uh, the world file describes uh, sort of a bunch of sort of all the objects in the world, um, many of which are loaded from the internal library. So for example, the arena here, the rectangular arena, which is the floor, um, is not included in the file I gave you because it's part of the system and can simply be invoked. Um, the specific robot uh, definition is defined here in the scene tree, and that is included in the world file because it's not part of the library. Um, it can also load your control code into this convenient editor. You don't have to use the editor. It's possible to edit the code uh, independently of WeBots, um, but it can be handy just to have it right in front of you. Um, if that window doesn't appear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the code panel. If I right-click on the robot object, one of the options is Edit Controller, and it will follow its search path to find the control, controller that has the same name uh, as defined within the robot object and load it for your editing. Um, and that could be Python, but it could also be C++ or Java, other, other MATLAB. Um, so that's sort of just a comment about that. Let's, I want to also just sort of tell you briefly what the model is uh, without going into great depth. This exercise is more about using the system and doing a little programming and not so much about modeling, um, but we will talk about modeling in the future. But just so that we understand what this is, uh, the blue box is a rigid object that's a box. Um, it's just resting on the floor. I assigned a lot of mass so it wouldn't move around much. Between the blue box and the, and the first red link, is a vertical pivot joint with a uh, simulated motor attached. Between, right at the very end of the first red link and uh, connecting to the green link, is a joint that is unactuated. Um, there's a position sensor out of there to, uh, just to have a device there, uh, but that joint does not exert actuated torques. It does have friction, however, so when I play the simulator, one of the effects is that the friction at that, that second joint uh, we might call it the elbow joint or just simply J2, um, does cause the green object to come to rest um, as, the, as the red arm deceler red link decelerates um, just because of frictional losses. And if we set that friction down to zero, we'll see a very different outcome. This is rigid body physics. Uh, this means that from the standpoint of the math, the, the various bodies, the blue, the red, the green bodies, are all modeled as perfect geometric solids with you know, no flexibility. They're perfectly rigid. And the joints are modeled as these idealized uh, pivots. Um, that allows calculations. Um, there is contact modeling between various surfaces that is parameterized so that there is you know, some amount of compliance um, and the constraints can be slightly violated. Um, so those are all sort of properties of simulation that we'll again also talk about in the future. But this, just to now to get that sense that there is, it's a two link arm on a massive base and the first joint is actuated with uh, a motor and the second joint is, is free to rotate up to the limits of friction. I think a practical thing to offer is to walk through the Python script line by line. I'm not actually assuming you know Python, although many students will have seen it. I think this is, uh, the comments will give you enough of a hint about what's going on to enable you to get through this exercise. So the top of the file has some comments just to sort of describing what's going on. All the lines being with the hash mark are comments. And then the first line, line 10, from controller import robot, capital R robot, that is the, you, um, importing the library code provided by WeBots to allow the Python program to communicate with the simulator. And that is the essence for how the, the, this program is not just some arbitrary program, but actually is connected to the simulator all of the functionality is provided by that library. And so the robot object, I'm sorry, the next line, line 12 there, prints a message that shows up in the console. That's just for our convenience so we can see it running. Um, lines 14, 15, lines 14 is the comment, lines 15, lowercase robot equals capital R robot. What's happening is that the Python script has just started. It's using the Web WeBots library to communicate to the simulator and fetch some kind of object that allows it to uh, sort of make requests to the simulator and receive data. So that's our proxy object that then will allow our script to have access to all of the different functionality within the simulator for the remote control. 
Looking a little further down, line 18, j0 equals robot.getMotor, and then the string motor1. That string is defined in the model. Over in the scene tree, the robot uh, has that first joint has a motor attached, and in there is a name. And it's these names that allow the two parts to communicate back and forth. The Python program uses that name to query the simulator remotely to get access to that motor within it. And then once it has a hand on that motor, it can use that to issue further requests. As it is, line 22 is that first request. And what this is doing is um, it's setting up the motor for velocity control. Essentially, the simulator has built-in low-level controllers on the actuation so that the control programs don't have to run at some incredibly high rate. The, effectively, one can command the motor to move to a position with some gains or move at a, certain, at a constant velocity with some gains. And then this underlying uh, motor simulation will act like a smart actuator and try to apply some control to go there. So in this case, I want to just simply command a constant velocity. And in order to do that, I, I also have to say that the, the target position for the motor is infinity. It's just a signal into this controller. So the float and then the conversion of that string inf is just sort of Python-esque way of getting an infinite number. But the key is that it takes the, the handle for joint zero, motor one, j0 j in this case is motor one, and it's calling the set position function in that motor and setting to infinity. And then line 26 is j0 set velocity of three is again calling the set, velo a set velocity function on this motor and passing in a target velocity of three radians per second. If you're accustomed to degrees, welcome to radians. It's much more standard in the robotics world to use radians than degrees. Three radians, it's two pi radians for a full revolution. So it's 3.14159 you know, pi radians for a half a revolution. So this is roughly 180 degrees per second. That's about what the target is. Um, that's as much a cultural note as anything, but it's common in, in robotics research to use radians for all angles. The next bit uh, down line 29, while true, is just starting an infinite loop. And the workflow here is that the, uh, the script calls this robot step function and basically says, uh, let the simulation run for some interval and then return back when it's done. So the robot will simulate for 2,000 milliseconds, two seconds of simulated time, and then return some status value. And the protocol is that when the simulator returns a minus one, that's an indication that the simulation has been, has been halted and is about to shut down. And so this program uh, is, is a, as a good citizen, simply at that point exits. So the, the line, if status equals minus one, break, is the Python way of checking whether that status value is equal to minus one, and if so, exiting the while true loop. And that, at that point, there's the, the script will just end. It'll just exit. So the next action is line 35, j0 set velocity to zero. That commands a stop, and then the controller will smoothly decelerate Applying a, uh, it's still applying velocity control, but just trying to achieve a velocity of, of zero, of motionlessness. The last clause is almost a duplicate of the previous one. It once again runs the simulator for 2,000 milliseconds, checks to see whether the simulation is done, and then sets a new target velocity of, once again, back to three radians per second. So that, that is a very simple scripted action. There's no sensing, there's no sort of high level detection of state, all it's doing is just on a, on a clock, like a metronome, uh, running a four second cycle where it uh, you know, tries to move, tries to stop. And we can see in the simulation that there's some, there's some masses and relatively low torques on the motor that it takes a little while to get moving and takes a little while to decelerate. The dynamic physics take this very simple, effectively square wave input and turn it into something else um, as a consequence of the dynamics. The second joint is an artifact of the physics. So the first joint is trying to apply torques. The entire mass of the machine is, you know, act, is acted upon. The, the dynamic properties vary slightly with position here. As the elbow is out versus in, there's subtly different kinds of accelerations that are feasible. And the net effect is that the, the whole pose of the machine is a consequence both of this uh, square wave activation plus all the physics taking place. And so this is the essence of algorithmic or generative animation here is that um, some, some detailed rules about physics combined with this uh, one kind of excitation uh, yields a more complicated result. And I think that's the thing we need to think about is what are the possibilities, expressive possibilities for you know, creating some system that gets more, much more complicated action um, out of 
some parsimonious kind of input. That would be uh, a lovely thing. A few more comments about just the simulator itself. Um, if you've played with the, the demos, you've seen that there's some very complicated robots in here. And um, if you actually try to look at them, you won't see much detail within this tree. Um, and the reason is mostly that there's a couple different ways that, that models are generated. Um, just to sort of show you the rectangular arena, which is the, the checkerboard pattern that is simply there as a ground surface to contain things. Um, it doesn't actually show much detail in its scene tree. Um, mostly because it's actually generated procedurally. And this is just kind of a hint to the future that the way that a lot of the objects are done is if you model in the scene tree kind of laboriously to create the kinematic structures like the links and the joints and the motors that connect them, it is then possible to translate that, transfer that into a text file that is a procedural program that can generate other objects. And that's one key for parameterizing things to make them more variable. We'll get to that later. Um, but that can also happen within the same interface. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a quick overview of kind of what's happening. This is more about uh, getting running with the exercise. Um, I think the essential question as far as an exercise is, uh, what are some ways to produce a performance from some very simple tools? I provided a kind of like deliberately crude, simple device that has the potential for interesting physics, but in a, in a kind of straightforward way. I'm, I'm not so interested at this point, I think, in toying with the parameters of the simulation. It certainly is possible to turn the friction to zero and then, you know, have the joints wind up to a high rate. And that is worth trying to see what happens. Um, and that's, you know, the model itself, though, is provided in this case as kind of a simple test bed to think about the problem of how can we create a performance. Um, in this case, it's just scripted, but the script still produces motions that are sort of more detailed than the script might, might sort of suggest. It's possible to add uh, functions and numerical code to create more detailed inputs to actually script, uh, generate, generate sort of generative or algorithmic performances. And that would be an approach to think about how to like just create movement. Um, there could be lots of stored data. There could be you know, different sequences that take place or different rhythmic patterns that take place governed by data. Um, those are all kind of things just to start thinking about. Um, in principle, this device has sensing in that the, the motor and the, the elbow sensor um, could, in theory, provide information back to the script so that it could then act upon the resulting poses and use that as an input for more generative action. Um, and that would be basically using a higher level control loop to, to actuate the system and then measure its state. That would be operating around the sort of underlying motor control loop that runs much faster. I think the highest order comment on these lines is, is that it's, it's very natural when thinking about animation to think about anthropomorphic form. It's, it's, it's not so hard for us to generate movements and improvise lots of movements on our own bodies. Um, we do it all the time. And, and here's a device which has some anthropomorphic character. It's a little bit like a, an arm held in a horizontal plane. But the elbow is not limited. It can go all the way around. And so it, it's not actually anthropomorphic. It just is suggestive. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a question, I think, for us as a class to think about how can uh, a device that is not anthropomorphic um, convey an idea that we will attach ourselves to, that we'll you know, some, feel some resonance with or um, some emotional weight. One suggestion that I like is uh, we still have rhythm and ictus and beat. Um, often, I think, a kind of musical or dance interpretation um, transcends the exact form. If there's a rhythmic pattern, that can be very suggestive. And if it, the rhythmic pattern includes not only motion, but uh, pauses and suspension of motion, um, that is often a way to achieve some kind of evocative uh, sequence. One last point here is that the robots have the advantage of time and patience. A robot will carry out program as long as it's physically capable um, to a level that humans may or may not be easily able to do. Um, conceptually, one could write a program that took you know a million years to execute um, we're not going to wait around for it to end but as a concept that would be a kind of machine performance that takes you well outside the domain of the human and is at least worth thinking about kind of what that means to either have something at very fast time scales or very slow time scales or just somehow non-human time scales is just another resource that we can bring to bear i hope this is enough to get you started and we'll follow up with more discussion in class and um, obviously this will, this will continue.